But I'm very um, pleased to uh, be introducing Karen Drysdale, uh, who has, well, I should probably use this at this point. Uh, Karen, Karen has been working at the centre with us for one year. We believe today um, is her anniversary, so um, that's fantastic. Uh, Karen works on a range of projects um, at the centre with a range of people here, but today is going to be um, looking backwards a little to her doctoral research, and I'll let her um, introduce that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Christy. Um, so I too wish to acknowledge the um, Indigenous caretakers of the land that we're meeting on today, uh, past, present and future. Um, and I also want to um, point out that while I'm talking about a particular urban infrastructure that was significant to the lesbian and queer women of Sydney, it was built on Gadigal land of the Aura Nation and their sovereignty was never ceded. Okay, so Wednesday night was colloquially known as Dyke Night in the inner west suburb of Newtown, promoted through alternative media outlets and spread by word of mouth as, a, as events for same-sex attracted women. The night's popularity was evident from the groups of people seen weaving their way through the congested sidewalks that linked the numerous bars and pubs that courted their patronage on this night of the week. At around 10 p.m., scores of these women made their way from King Street to the Sly Fox Hotel, a local bar approximately a 10 minute walk away on Enmore Road. For over a decade, this venue hosted a series of events featuring drag king performances. And repeated week after week, this series of events quickly became the basis of a thriving social scene. So drag kinging can be loosely described as a cultural practice in which individuals and conventionally they're thought of as women, but they've certainly included gender diverse people um, through over time, consciously enact masculinity within the context of the performance. The term drag queen can be traced back to 1930s underground homosexual subcultures where it denoted a gay male who dressed as a woman primarily for the entertainment of others. This historical context led Jack Halberstam, one of the earliest scholars of drag king cultures, to claim in 1998 that the truth is as long as we've known the phrase drag queen, the drag king has been a concept waiting to happen. So drag king cultures took root almost simultaneously from the 1990s onwards in major urban centres with established nighttime economies that featured lesbian targeted events. Drag king performers argue for the uniqueness of their practice as distinct from other traditions of performance and lived experience. So this includes theatrical conventions of male impersonation, uh, the presentation of masculine and lesbian styles and the non-performative strategies that involve women passing as men. So just as drag queens are generally perceived to be an indicator of gay and male culture, drag kings are broadly associated with lesbian culture. But this association is beset by chal with challenges, not least of which is that there is nothing about drag kinging that is necessarily corresponds to a universal lesbian practice. So we didn't have to take drag king 101 classes to, to become a lesbian. Okay, so in this talk today, I want to use the highly visible spectacle of the drag king performer as an opportunity to reflect on the lesbian social scene that took place across the first two decades of the 21st century. Specifically, I want to approach Sydney's local drag king culture not as a product of a globally recognised performance style, but forming the basis of a distinct social entity. So here, I want to say that drag king events need to be identified as different from, though arguably influenced by, Sydney's contemporary queer performance culture. And not all lesbian or queer identified women in Sydney participated in drag king cultures, and some held very strong aversions to what they saw was apolitical parody and offence in the performance of masculinity. While many participated in a range of events across a social spectrum in Sydney, routine and attendance at drag king events marked certain people out as regulars. And this, I think, represents a form of social organisation that designates a distinctive cultural context. So this is essentially an approach that reviews local drag king events through the concept of scene, uh, which I take mainly from the work of Will Straw. Within the theoretical uh, tradition of cultural studies, scene theory provides a conceptual framework that sees events as a form of social engagement, as much as performance practice or subcultural site. Framing Sydney's local version within the coordinates of scene theory momentarily displaces the need for us to have a universally recognised drag king culture and instead allows us to review the range of everyday experiences that culminate from the myriad social interactions generated in the vicinity of the drag king performances. So indeed drag king events offer the opportunity for participation outside of a performance audience dynamic 
with women drinking, dancing and socialising long after the last performance of the evening. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that scenes come to mean far more than just the busy work of urban social interaction for those who are invested in their ongoing or involving existence. While scenes occupy an entrenched form in everyday life, they also function as an alternative to the, um, to the mundane, as something that can be thrown up against, um, and in relief against, sorry, the everyday cultural landscape. So drag king events absorbed and reflected a range of strongly held investments to a specifically lesbian inflected quality established by what I'm conveniently and somewhat unoriginally calling the act of being together. It's how this quality manifests and is sustained that interests me and was actually the, the subject of my doctoral research. But first, a brief account of the scene's emergence. Uh, by the mid-1990s, there was building momentum taking place in Sydney in the creation of a local version of the types of drag king cultures that were happening in predominantly the US, the UK and Canada. The earliest performances that we might now recognise as drag kings uh, were seen at queer performance events aimed at female attendees, uh, such as Club Kooky, Girlesque and Wicked Women. These earlier appearances, though, were considered more of a lineup of the entertainment rather than its focus. Uh, larger club nights, such as On the Other Side, Moist and Dangerous, often pause the music for a brief interlude, with drag kings sometimes providing the midnight show. However, it was a series of competition nights, Drag King Sydney, or better known as DKSY, which is widely credited as mobilising interest in the creation of a distinctive drag king culture as separate to the types of queer performance events that were happening around Sydney that time. Uh, DKSY was held at Ark Nightclub in Oxford Street between 1999 and 2000. As part of a deal struck between the venue and the organisers Lisa Campbell, who also performed as Drag King Divinal, and resident DJ Kate Monroe, Drag Kings temporarily took over a space that had up until then only hosted drag queens. And its commercial success demonstrated that drag king performances too could bring in the crowds. So while Sydney's drag king scene emerged from these pioneering efforts in carving out performance spaces for women, it became more firmly associated with the social lesbian culture that developed around Newtown's nightlife economy. By that time, Wednesday night in Newtown had increasingly took on the moniker of Dyke Night. Uh, also known as Lesbian Night, Girls' Night and Wednesday. Wednesday is coming back as well, I've seen. So while it was originally promoted as a way to maybe boost midweek, uh, flagging midweek profits, Dark Night became fa uh, fast became a local institution, with a number of venues joining in and local gay media adopting the terminology. A range of peripheral activities became directly associated with Wednesday nights, including organised pool competition and band acts at the Bank, Imperial and Newtown Hotels, and also, while not directly promoted by some venues, the number of women seen taking over otherwise straight bars and clubs midweek, such as the Courthouse and the Marlborough, all contributed to the cultivation of a distinctly lesbian quality of the night in Newtown. So it's within this commercial context that Sexy Galaxy, who had also competed in the DKSY competitions, together with DJ Sveta, a well-known DJ on the queer party circuit, established Kinky Kingdom in 2002. Hosted by the Sly Fox Hotel on Enmore Road, Kinky Kingdom was scheduled on a Wednesday to draw on the burgeoning popularity of Dark Knight. But like DKSY, partnering drag king performers with commercially successful DJs in the creation of these instrumental nights worked to extend the, the uh, function of events from solely a performance space to include a range of tangential activities more in line with social itineraries. So the scene was born with the visible and distinctive drag king at its helm. After Sexy's uh, departure in 2006, Kinky Kingdom was renamed Queer Central and for the remainder of its run. So running weekly for over a decade at a single site, Queer Central was the first series of events to become associated with a specific venue, the Sly Fox Hotel. And as such, this venue stands out as an enduring fixture within Sydney's drag king scene. The success of the night as a regular feature also contributed to the cementation of Wednesday night as the epicentre of broader lesbian social culture in Newtown. At the same time, the emergence and maintenance of Sydney's drag king scene took place within a longer trajectory of mobile place making for lesbian and queer women. The arrangement made with the Sly Fox Hotel is not inconsistent with a longer history of lesbian spatial tenancy. Amid the rise in commercial venues in the 1960s and 70s that catered predominantly towards gay men, 
a tentative lesbian bar scene was slowly established within existing gay venues rather than separate to them. Throughout the 1980s, especially women were fit, sorry, lesbians were fitted into non-lesbian bars as a gesture or as a way to boost trade on a quiet night. Continuing into the 1990s and early 2000s, lesbian spaces in Newtown can be characterised as what Andrew Gorman Murray and Catherine Nash call mobile spaces, in that they were constituted as gay and lesbian friendly by patterns of patronage, the organisation of localised knowledge and transient flows of capital. So women's use of public leisure spaces overall has been shaped by private networks, extending into the sites of social activities where new spaces become temporarily available. The lack of secure tenancy and insufficient capital often inhibited further commercial development of a distinctive and stable lesbian bar culture in Sydney. As such, the lesbian nighttime economy of Dark Night is more identifiable through informal networks of event promotion rather than a territorial model of commercial occupancy. Over time, a great deal of personal capital was expended in the production and promotion of Drag King events that kept shows running for over a decade. So we can certainly view that drag king performances were part of a wider nighttime economic arrangement, drawing people into venues with significant expenditure in terms of bar takings. And I think at the height of Queer Central's popularity, we're talking about 10 grand over the bar in a single night. Um, but these do not ever extend to financing long-term commercial real estate opportunities. So instead of direct promotion and marketing to, to a lesbian clientele, venue management would turn their spaces over to autonomous promoters who would, for a fixed rate or door sales, organise specific nights. Organisers would then advertise drag king events through social media, queer media outlets, and especially by word of mouth, taking on the costs of um, producing events with venue management rarely financially contributing. More important to the scene's survival, however, were the strong yet vacillating interpersonal relationships that connected drag king promoters, performers and DJs, as well as their extended friendship networks that brought people through the door, especially in the earlier years. So instead, it might be more accurate to view how Sydney's drag king scene developed via the temporary borrowing of the infrastructure of Newtown's nightlife economy. Sydney's drag king scene then is a really good example of the types of reciprocal investments made between sites and sociability, especially when seen as an extension of wider lesbian networks in the city. So while the Sly Fox Hotel never promoted itself as an LGBTIQ venue um, and it hosted drag king performances only one night of the week, it nonetheless appeared in many local and international guides to gay and lesbian nightlife in Sydney. But we have to always remember that these were at best precarious arrangements. Uh, with not so much more than more, uh, promise week to week and often subject to disputes with venue management. And this makes Queer Central's decade long run all the more remarkable because of its resilience under these really difficult uh, commercial conditions. But what happens when scenes fade, as they always do? Um, this, is a bit, this is actually a recent um, screen grab from a Facebook update, but it was also something that took place a lot around the time of the scene's demise. So despite the conditions it operated under, it still came as a surprise to us um, in 2002 in September, when the venue abruptly discontinued ho hosting drag king performances. The cessation of Queer Central marked the end of an era of drag kinging in Sydney. As a devoted fan, I was often drawn to drag king performances, but more so the social scene that it supported. But there is regrettably very little archival evidence generated about Sydney's drag king scene that can be said to be insulated against the passage of time and the vagaries of individual collection. For example, the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives have nothing on Sydney's drag king scene. So this sad state of archival affairs eventually led me to undertake doctoral research, a doctor of drag kings, if you will, <laughs> couldn't resist that. Um, as a justification for the collection um, and preservation of scene stories. Now for the remainder of the talk, all the quotes that I'm going to use are taken from a series of three focus groups held with 13 individuals who identified as a scene participant and content consented to be part of the study. Scheduled just months before Queer Central's end and therefore just at a time of the scene's demise, this ethnographic encounter was ideally positioned to capture the thoughts and feelings of people in a scene that was at risk of fading from social view. Yet the timing of these focus groups raised the stakes of the conversations, forcing participants to confront the practical considerations of what are essentially ephemeral moments within an otherwise unremarkable 
itinerary of catching up and hooking up occasionally with friends and lovers at these events. Okay, at the height of drag, of, of, sorry, Queer Central's popularity, masses of women would be crammed into the tight spaces comprising the Sly Fox Hotel's interior, pushing up and pressing against each other in the dark, jostling for room on the crowded dance floor while roars of approval for the drag kings on stage filled the air. At an elementary level, this press of bodies was the material condition of being together at drag king events. But it was a condition that was felt as a particularly charged sensation. As one fan described it, the atmosphere in those hot, crowded spaces was one where desire circulated with such force that you could smell it in the air. How then can being together be articulated in terms of a singularity of experience that lingers beyond the shared pleasures of performance? Or more precisely, why does desire matter as a condition of participation, especially when desire could be conceivably felt or oriented towards any number of things? So perhaps the strongly held sensations of desire take shape not so much as a unilateral response to the drag king on stage, but to more powerful yet fleeting impressions of togetherness in those hot crowded spaces. So in reviewing the implications of desire as a collective endeavor, I turned to the work of Lauren Ballant to engage with the possibilities of non-heterosexual ways of being in the world. Intimacy, as Ballant tells us in her introduction to the special journal issue on the subject, and I'm gonna quote, involves an aspiration for a narrative of something shared that is simultaneously set within the zones of familiarity and comfort. Yet as Ballant goes on, the inwardness of the intimate is met by a corresponding publicness. For Ballant, the politics endemic in public spheres are effective in that they attach people to each other and to institutions and to ideologies. But I'm really interested that a public sphere can be intimate when it promises the sense of being loosely held in a social world. So the idea of intimate publics links the ephemerality of individual experiences of desire to a broader collective trajectory. So thinking with both publics and intimacy, or how publics can be intimate, accounts for the relations between people that can facilitate an effective register of belonging that, and again I'm quoting, produces the sense, if not the scene, of a more livable and intimate sociality amid the more formalised politics of reclamation of space for minority cultures. So to summarise that bit up, <laughs> I suggest what is central to the expressions of desire is the desire for intimacy in the scene. And this intimacy is better conceived as the desire to connect with others and the sense of a world that's brought into being through that connection. Participation in Sydney's drag king scene can be better, better understood through its implication in wider imaginaries of lesbian social worlds of which desire is considered an essential part. So for now, just let me suggest that the demand by participants to acknowledge desire in the scene has two functions. First, desire is used to indicate the presence of same-sex eroticism that is characteristic of lesbian cultures. And second, desire becomes the platform on which being together is enacted as a phenomenon that requires protection. And as I hope to demonstrate in the rest of this talk that these two functions of desire cannot be disentangled from each other. So, <laughs> but despite the feelings of desire and intimacy that the scene engendered, <laughs> drag king events also offered alternative modes of engagement and not all of them pleasurable. In one of the focus groups, Kate was especially vocal about the way that friendships animated around the scene have the potential to turn into drama. And Kate's use of the word drama is a, res um, for anyone who doesn't know, is a res recognised lesbian vocabulary that refers to the negative interactions between people owing to entangled social and sexual practices. Here, I think Kate's statement somewhat underplays the role of drama in lesbian social groups. The other's responses to Kate's admission of her involvement in drama reveal how everybody viewed this as an inevitable part of how lesbian worlds work, almost as a cliche come to life. Reflecting on these encounters produced a litany that indicated the usual sources. Who was there? Who said what? Who ignored who? Who they made out with? And it's always over girls. In fact, part of the attraction of the scene was its capacity to stage these dramas alongside the more formal shows that are the explicit entertainment rationale. Put another way, dramas within the audience were just as entertaining as the drag king performances on stage. 
So with this capacity for internal conflict in mind, it's worth looking to the particularity of the differing identity politics circulating within and around drag king events. Uh, in many of the formal and informal conversations I had over the five years of this study, people variously used the term lesbian, dyke, gay and queer to uh, refer to the identities that the scene encompassed. So what I want to do now, just to illustrate this, is look at three very different examples given by participants of how individual investments in drag king events were squarely centred on the identitarian politics demanded of performances. In the first example, Robin read the masculinised practices and presentation on stage as reflective of her own gendered identity as an, as an audience member. She, she suggested that the performances by drag kings reflected how I perceive myself at that particular point and were an extension of my own subconscious mind. Reading herself as a masculinised woman, drag kings were for her a backup or validity of her identity, and watching uh, performances allowed her to feel that a part of her was fulfilled. In the second example, Leonie attested that she attended drag king shows because they were representative of a uniquely yet globally recognised lesbian culture. Talking about the recent visible dominance of drag queens at the Sly Fox Hotel at the time of the scene's eventual demise, she expressed disappointment that it lacked representation of our side on the stage, stating unequivocally that there was no lesbian representation, there was no girl representation. Now in contrast to the last two examples, Brooke saw events representational capacity as deriving from a broader sense of queer performances. For her, the performances constituted a beautiful array of queerness in the context of a community spirit. This suggests that Brooks saw drag king events as exercising a form of community ethos, as an umbrella rather than a static identity. I just included the first part of that phrase because so anyone who doesn't know drag king performances are like, hang on, what? <laughs> What's happening there? <laughs> so while participants used a variety of identity markers, such as masculine, lesbian, queer, and so on, to distinguish between the specific identity categories in which they saw themselves similarly implicated in. These examples also reveal the capacity of drag king events to hold together loosely aligned constituencies. The drag king events representational fluidity allowed participants to put aside specific iterations of sexual identity within a cultural context generally affiliated with a lesbian demographic. But I would like to take this analysis just one step further because I think at heart, taken at face value, there's a, the contradiction between the internal heterogeneity that can be accommodated at the same time as maintaining a sense of singularity of a specifically lesbian inflected social desire is a bit of a contradiction. So I was using Lawrence Grosberg's work of affective alliances and differences as one way of theorising how participants secured an attachment to the scene despite the internal divisions and dramas. Um, and I find that affective relations works to complement and extend Berlant's outward facing publics and inward facing intimacies. So for Grosberg, scene making generally involves an investment in the idea of a connective phenomenon between diverse participants. That's pretty obvious. Um, however, he places more emphasis on the constitutive role of effective alliances in generating this connection through a process of participation. So according to Grosberg, effective alliances are an organisation of concrete material practices and events, cultural forms and social experience that opens up and structures the space of our effective investments in the world. Effective alliances are established through participation that aligns participants or aligns sorry, individuals to the scene and it's also a process that organises relations between the sociality of drag king events and the shared perception of lesbian desire. For instance, the sense of one of us was based on regular attendance, an easy visible indicator of recognisable participation that produced congeniality with others in the scene. Participants talked about uh, the non-verbal gestures such as the, the head nod from across the room, the smile on arrival that were greetings demonstrated in acknowledgement of another's status as regular. But this is also in part due to the limited access of knowledge about drag king events, as in those in the know knew where to go, that worked to deliver pre-sorted and pre-selected crowds to venues. So Gillian, for example, suggested that people knew of drag king events as events for lesbian and queer identified women, based on the fact that most people wouldn't go to a queer venue unless the, you know what it is, you know? And if people did walk in by accident, the implication um, is that they would know that they were out of space, out of place, sorry. 
Participants often use this really mocking tone to describe the lost little sheep that wandered into drag king events and realised that they didn't belong. But it's not simply relations of social belonging and cohesion that give the sense, the scene, sorry, it's, its cultural intelligible form. Grosberg argues that effective alliances also require effective differences, that a line be drawn between us and them to inscribe a boundary between the scene and the outside world. In all of the participants' accounts of Sydney's drag king scene, there was clear gatekeeping taking place involving the demarcation between gay, lesbian and queer identified people and heterosexual others. The effective alliance of one of us simultaneously implies difference from them. Like all easy binary formulations, this simple distinction collapsed any further differences between us and straight people. And this is borne out by the fact that participants were adamant that danger was present in the figure of the straight man. All were firm that unaccompanied heterosexual men were unwelcome at events, using words like threatening and unsafe to characterise their presence. But by far, the majority of participants saw straight men as sexually predatory, connecting male heterosexuality with sexual menace. And here, Holly's statement demonstrates the force of her defensiveness to straight men. There's been a lot of guys who don't seem to be with dykes, and it's like, oh my God, do you not know this is a queer venue? Are you going to start picking up? Are you going to start hitting on me and being offensive? I don't want to deal with this shit. Apologies to any straight men in the audience. <laughs> However, over the course of my five year engagement with Sydney's drag king scene, I never witnessed any overt conflict between predatory straight men and lesbian patrons in venues. And this is in sharp contrast to the frequency of drama between women at events that often led to more physical confrontations. The regularity of fights was so much so that Leone attributed the presence of a security guard in the, car, in the car park a block over to the lesbians on Wednesday night who decide to have fights. In reality, any encounter between straight men and lesbian patrons was considered more of a case of mild annoyance or mistaken identity in that, as Lisa said, you get random people here that are so drunk that they don't realise that the event is gay. So, it seemed to me, however, that the perceived safety of drag king venues was not necessarily about women's capacity to engage in same-sex practices protected from the threat of homophobic violence or sexualised menace. Rather, the unspoken assumption behind the fears explicitly expressed was that, regardless of any actual threat of violence, the entry into straight, of straight men into these spaces would disrupt the perception of collective intimacy. Now, it's interesting that the Concerns voiced by participants contradict much of the empirical work conducted that found that heterosexual women pose far more of a threat to gay and lesbian spaces than straight men. So these participants concentrate the threat of territorial takeover directly on heterosexual men despite the fact that gentrification or subcultural absorption by the mainstream is rarely so gender specific. The idea of, straight, of safe spaces that the drag king scene represents for its patrons is so wrapped up in a specifically gendered intimacy that anxieties about its instability can only be attached to the straight man. Consequently, they articulate the need for protection from him and him alone in the form of an immovable, effective difference. The minimal commercial infrastructure, the fact that there was no dedicated permanent spaces allocated to drag king performances, and the reliance on interpersonal connections for the running of events are much more reasonable threats to the scene's um, sustainability. But um, those conditions lend an air of unreliability that work to underpin the sense of a scene's precarity. However temporary as they might prove to be in the long run, drag king events always involved a process of site marking. There is then a deeper connection between how participants perceive the threat of the straight man to the wider processes of recognition and validation of lesbian space. <clears throat> if the straight man is a product of the effective differences imagined as a disruption to the potential for collective intimacy, it is not surprising that participants' articulation of desire went hand in hand with their proprietary or protectionist stance on scene territory. The sense of a scene can be temporarily stabilised when participants articulate an attachment to preserving the lesbian characterisation of space. Uh, so in Heroic Desire, Sally Munt traces how being a lesbian is both an ontological statement of insurgency and an enactment of desire. 
I found that by linking practice to identity, seeing participants use pronouncement of desire to signal non-normative sexuality that marked them as distinct from heterosexuals. At the same time, it, they engendered feelings of lesbian social, um, solidarity, and this is a term I'm taking from Kennedy and Davis's groundbreaking work um, on lesbian communities, uh, when under, only when under threat from the straight man. So the imagined precarity of the space generated a collective sense of almost a performative lesbian identity. So, and I'm using this quote as representative, there were far more um, voiced by participants that had less um, passion to it. Um, so immediately after Robin had rejected the idea that she had to choose a scene, along with the implication of the uh, politicization of identity, she asserted the legitimacy of claiming a lesbian label. You know, say they want to call me a lesbian. Lesbian's a power word. It's like everybody walks around going, there's no labels anymore. It's like there are fucking labels. Labels are actually power. So you can call yourself something. And that's what you are, you know. Okay. So the way that Robin articulated her attachment to the word lesbian is representative of how many in the scene saw themselves, as I'm paraphrasing Sally Munt again, as a dual outlaw heroic figure in an otherwise hostile world. This is because Sydney's drag king scene produces a social imaginary that serves as, on one hand, a site for which diverse investments can be momentarily anchored and accommodated, such as we saw in the examples with the three identity politics played out in drag king performances. And on the other hand, justification for the ongoing perception of the lesbian sexual intimacy as under threat from outsiders. So this is a way to account for those constant feelings of precarity and instability that characterise the scene. This sense of precarity allowed participants to put aside inconsistent or contradictory desires, as well as the dubious reality of straight men picking fights, in order to bring about the collective alliances in maintaining the sense of scene cohesion. It's interesting then that the presumptions of sexuality and identity made of heterosexual otherness were actively resisted by those within the scene. I hate that question where people are like, so are you? Kate claimed with no apparent sense of irony. And it's like, I don't know you, why do I have to define myself to you? Participants consistently insisted upon their own intent, internal differentiation, while at the same time as denying that differentiation to others. And this allows scenes to retain their internal heterogeneity while participants claim an effect of differences from non-participants. Tensions that exist within the scene, such as the internal dramas and divisions between identity politics, are minimised by displacing host um, hostility onto the symbolic straight man. So for instance, a meat market vibe that Holly spoke of as part of the sexualised conduct between participants at events that you'd think would, would fracture feelings of intimacy, actually worked um, when she, in retrospect, neatly pinned that onto the straight man as an effective difference. So here, desire still exists as a predominant impression of the scene. But in a deft move, deflecting desire into sexual menace allowed participants to see the heterosexual men as the threat to the scene's stability, at the same time as underscoring the presence of desire as a pleasurably felt condition of being together at events. So this returns me back to Lauren Balance's um, Publix. Lesbian identity is broadly conceived of is in the connection between the sociality of drag king events and its potential for, poten uh, for collective intimacy, but only when that connection is under threat. So we can see how Les um, sorry, Berlant's concept of publics works as an outward facing um, in the proclamation of the validity of lesbian and inward facing in its accommodation of difference in the quest for sustaining intimacy. So valorising an expansive, inclusive lesbian identity in this way has the auxiliary effect of supporting tolerance for internal tensions and contradictions in the face of an external threat posed by either homophobia or heterosexual takeover. So on the whole, um, these comments tend to echo the broader debates around the, the threat of the term queer to lesbian recognition. The rising popularity of drag king culture has coincided with a time of heightened debate around identity especially evident in the rise of queer to extend or replace lesbian as a marker of non-normative object desire in women. But equally important to keep in mind is that the political and practical implications of the umbrella term queer have been vigorously contested and are consistently in flux. So while the term lesbian has been rejected by some as an outdated identity category and as a mode of collective organisation, it's also been subject to revision and renewal within and against the term queer. So here I think that the relationship is a little bit reversed. 
um, that lesbian operates as the umbrella term, while queer is the very precise marker that allows people to claim an identity politics within the scene. So at the end of the day, the category of the lesbian, it seems, refuses to go away. But here, in Sydney's late drag king scene, it was clear that the recourse to lesbian identity as both outlawed and heroic was in response to the precarity that characterised events and moreover was essential to the, scene of, uh, the sense of cohesion that it engenders. Space comes to mean so much in terms of how these participants envision the outcome of being together that a longer history of identity politics is condensed in such a small square metrage. And so I speculate that in any other scenario, strongly articulated investments in non-heterosexual identity, be it butch, lesbian, dyke or queer, might come into conflict in the formation of tightly stratified subjectivities. But here in the scene, the elaboration of politicised identities was deployed in such a way that it pushes out the boundaries of a scene actively shaped by the convergence of different distinctive cultural interests, tastes and affiliations at the same time as serving as the basis for its self-perpetuation. While the contradiction between lesbian and queer cannot wholly be resolved here, I suggest that it might function as a productive tension in the scene. Rather than fracturing a sense of social cohesion, internal heterogeneity works to reinforce the scene's capacity to generate an inclusive social imaginary at the same time as insisting on a tightly compressed sense of political differentiation from heterosexuals. And acknowledging the precarity of a scene raises the stakes of those investments in identity. As a political condition, precarity is marked by the unequal power relations that exacerbate the precariousness of some subjects compared to others. And the legacy of unstable lesbian social spaces bears this out when compared to gay men's spatial occupancy in Sydney. Thinking about Oxford Street and its uh, commercial infrastructure that was catered predominantly and exclusively sometimes to gay men. Um, especially where the lack of commercial infrastructure in lesbian venues has seen events surface in short-lived bouts. And so the sense of precarity does something. It makes attachments to things matter. But to end with some conjecture, there's been a recent resurgence of drag king performances in Sydney since 2017, propelled in part by Cat Dopper's Heats Gay Queer Parties, which have been promoting a series of uh, events called Sydney Drag Kings. Um, and this name bears remarkable similarity to Drag King Sydney competition, which sparked off the scene originally. Intentional homage or um, homage or coincidental word arrangement, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, recently, a Facebook group um, by Drag King, that Steve Guy, has been launched to promote the art of Drag King and to circulate information about upcoming events and opportunities. Both of these series of events um, and Facebook page have attracted a predominantly female or at least a non-cisgender male following. Canned Fruit, run by Alex Dugan and Andy Tomasis, is an event for queer and um, drag performance art that has been running for just under a year. But they've recently started up an event called New, New Kings on the Block, um, with the aim of providing a platform to showcase specifically drag kings. And they've just run their third edition of that event in, nine, in eight months. And on the 14th of uh, July, DJ Sveta is bringing back Queer Central for one night only at the Imperial Hotel, and tickets are on sale now. She told me to say that. Um, and while there are other events uh, where, sorry, and there are other events where drag kings might be seen amid queens and other performance artists, such as the Oyster Club, Rule 34, Butcher's Fuck, and Unicorns, and the list probably goes on. Yet the drag king performances over the past year have been mobile events, more akin to pop-ups or where drag kings feature sporadically rather than the regular run like we saw at Queer Central half a decade ago. Does this mean that the same investments in space are no longer available? And without that space being under threat, does the proclamation of, to use Robin's phrase, the power of the lesbian remain? What other events then might coalesce around this new culture of drag kinging? It's too early to tell, and in any case, the precise conditions that characterise Sydney's drag king scene in its heyday can never be entirely replicated. It was the end of an era, indeed. With the closure of iconic lesbian bars the world over, concomitant with continuing debates over whether, whether the term lesbian is even relevant amid the more queer gender politics of the 21st century, will the return of the king bring back the lesbians in Sydney? Only time will tell. Thank you.
you, Karen. Um, can I open up for questions? Comments, etc. Um, oh, don't know where to start, but, but one thing is uh, you mentioned part of the experience was the materiality of being amongst <coughs> so many bodies mm. in the um, being a spectator in, in the Drag King show. And I wondered in the period of time since the close of that scene and perhaps the re-rise now, whether the consumption of culture has moved to different spaces, particularly digitally, as many other consumptions of cultures have moved in that time. Yeah, I, I doubt it. There's been a, has always been a very strong performance, a queer performance culture in Sydney. Um, and I think that those spaces have, or have, have shifted to accommodate um, drag king performers. So uh, thinking about Fancy Piece, um, who, anyone seen Fancy Piece before? So, you know, they are now moved into the burlesque performance scene. Um, so I think that, and you can always see a performance in Sydney. We've got some amazing spaces like Red Rattler in Marrickville, um, which has been sort of like set up to really but accommodate the these. channels for these performances? Well, there's not actually, there's a couple of YouTube videos of drag kings um, from one of Mardi Gras um, drag king competitions back in 2012. Um, there's a couple of ones by sneakers. There's nothing a fancy piece, much to the regret. So there's, there's actually not much material evidence at all about these performance cultures and definitely nothing about the scene that it supported. So that, that was my kind of original. I mean, I think um, back in 2014, I asked fancy piece if I could use one of the performances for a lecture and they were like, we don't have any video of it. And the tricky thing was, is that at the time, this is the time the scene started where mobile phones weren't in common use, especially for smartphones that are capable of recording. Fair, the Facebook didn't exist at the very start of this sort of thing. Um, and at the time of the performances, the MC would actually tell audience members not to record, not to take photos, partly to protect, I guess, the sort of, um, the ownership of the art by the performers, but also because some of the performances were pretty explicit. I mean, you didn't want that stuff getting around. <laughs> Um, which actually worked to the detriment of preserving the sense of a scene in, it, in its decline. So, I kind of just like to add to that as well. The last Sydney Kings performance as well, they were still seeing not to record. So yeah, that was in that secret warehouse yeah, party. Yeah, so it was that's another kind of interesting thing. Like this last run of the Sydney Drag King things has taken up spaces in really unconventional sites. Uh, so Max Black, who are a purveyor of um, sex toys, I don't know her a euphemism for that, um, opened up their offices to host a drag king performances. And then the most recent one was at a secret warehouse location where we were only told of the address the day before. And you sort of turned up at this dark um, industrial street and got ushered into this kind of warehouse with a performance space. So, and I think that those, they're really exciting and it's really great that these mobile sort of events are popping up, but you don't have that same sense of ownership or proprietary on, uh, space that I think the, the sort of queer central run engendered. Yeah, and I was also going to ask you, you were stressing like the difference between the separation of drag king and being part of the queer theatre scene in general at the time. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, during the time, did drag kings kind of associate themselves as part? Like, did they view it as queer contemporary theatre? Some did and some didn't. So, I mean, we ha I think there has to be some acknowledgement that Sydney's drag king scene came out of queer performance. Um, so a lot of queer performance artists like Barb Totterdell, Simone O'Brien, a whole bunch more that have just disappeared from my head, um, would probably call themselves queer performance artists rather than drag kings, though they did drag kinging. Um, over time, people started to separate out those dis the distinction between queer performance in terms of um, the type of artistic ownership, I guess, over drag kinging, of a masculinised performance. You know, so at the same time, Fancy Piece, for example, would call themselves drag kings in the context of Queer, of queer Central, but they used to run the Pussycat Club on Oxford Street, which was a queer performance night, and they were queer artists. So um, I think the distinction, and I've talked about this loads in the thesis, um, is kind of arbitrary. <laughs> Um, I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for drag kings about that. Um, and I think actually that the types of definitional contestation gives the scene a sense of momentum and dynamism. Like it, it makes it stop being really static because if you can keep pushing against what a drag king may or may not be, then you have this kind of like sense of a scene working its way towards something. Thanks. 
I have a question. <laughs> Can you tell us about scenes in any, any other parts of the world? Oh, <laughs> well, there's lots of them. <laughs> drag king scenes. Yeah, yeah. so um, the major ones that were happening, especially the stuff that was written about by Jack Halverston in the 1990s was happening <laughs> in the US and the UK. Um, and some of the really big cl like Club Casanova and stuff like that are the sort of ones that come to mind. Um, however, I've seen drag king scenes in Mexico City. Um, uh, I met an Israeli drag king once. So, and that's part of the thing about, I think, the delineation between drag king and, not, and other types of performance is that they can kind of meld and separate as the needs be when those demands are met. But I mean, if you look at drag king culture as a social scene, then it's like a little bit different from the idea of the sort of physical, the visible, visible sorry, drag king stuff. You know, because the drag kings can create Facebook pages and have online memberships and things like that where people can follow their, um, their performances. But I think that the type of social scenes that get generated around that are very site specific and are very localised kind of versions of, of cultures, of, of cultural cultures, cultural intelligible forms. So no, no examples of, of cross national well, they performers? Had, there was the International Drag King Extravaganza, which was a big drag king conference that was hosted up uh, in the US and Canada over time. I think it had about six, a six year run, but that's also kind of slow, died a slow death, um, which I think is maybe concomitant with the sort of decline of those specific localised scenes that were happening in each of those different locales as well. So, I mean, I think there's lots of, there's a, at the moment I've seen a, a US based drag kings of colour group that has arisen and they apparently do um, performances specifically promoting drag kings by people of colour. So, I mean, and they're sort of, they're all coming and going all over the place. And, you know, I thought that, honestly, when I wrote the thesis, I thought that the Sydney drag king scene was dead and done. And, yeah, it's coming back <laughs> in a particular form. <laughs> Anybody else? Last questions? Yep. Uh, so I note one of the performers coming up in, in the July event um, was featured from a photo from 2006 or something like that. So is that a, a feature that people are recycling oh, these themselves? Yeah. These ones are old photos. Yes, but on, yes. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah also and then Swing. it's listed here for coming up in July. Yeah, so, so Javante has been performing fairly consistently. So would perform special nights at Lemons, I think has been a couple of um, things as well. But there was no like drag king scene that sort of like developed um, following him. Um, and I think, um, oh, what is John, John Dark is um, Lillian Starr's drag king alter ego. And as a burlesque performer, Lillian Starr will often bring out John Dark for particular performances, but never advertises drag king. So, and I think that once you get a bit of momentum, then you start to get people calling themselves or categorising the performances as drag kings, as opposed to a performance, you know. But yes, Gervanti is a pretty well-known, beloved drag king. Anyone seen Gervanti? Does all this really, yeah, the smooth, sexy dancing, <laughs> which I can't do, clearly. <laughs> Okay, well, we might wrap up. Please join me in thanking Karen. Thank you.